Arthur, Sanskrit, Arthur is one of the four aims of human life in Indian philosophy. The word Artha literally translates as, "...meaning, sense, goal, purpose or essence", depending on the context. Artha is also a broader concept in the scriptures of Hinduism. As a concept, it has multiple meanings, all of which imply, "...means of life." Activities and resources that enable one to be in a state one wants to be in. Artha applies to both an individual and a government. In an individual's context, Artha includes wealth, career, activity to make a living, financial security, and economic prosperity. The proper pursuit of Artha is considered an important aim of human life in Hinduism. At government level, Arthur includes social, legal, economic and worldly affairs. Proper Arthashastra is considered an important and necessary objective of government. In Hindu traditions, Arthur is connected to the three other aspects and goals of human life: dharma, virtuous, proper, moral life; karma, pleasure, sensuality, emotional fulfillment; and moksha, liberation, release, self-actualization. Together, these mutually non-exclusive four aims of life are called purusartha. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Definition and meaning. Artha as a concept includes multiple meanings. It is difficult to capture the meaning of artha, or related terms of dharma, karma, and moksha, each in a single English word. John Lochtfeld describes artha as the means of life, and includes material prosperity. Karl Potter explains it as an attitude and capability that enables one to make a living, to remain alive, to thrive as a free person. It includes economic prosperity, security and health of oneself and those one feels responsible for. Arthur includes everything in one's environment that allows one to live. It is neither an end state nor an endless goal of aimlessly amassing money, claims Karl Potter, rather it is an attitude and necessary requirement of human life. John Collar takes a different viewpoint than Karl Potter's interpretation. John Collar suggests Arthur is not an attitude, rather it is one of the necessities of human life. A central premise of Hindu philosophy, claims Collar, is that every person should live a joyous and pleasurable life, that such fulfilling life requires every person's needs and desires be acknowledged and fulfilled, that needs can only be satisfied through activity and when sufficient means for those activities are available. Arthur, then, is best described as pursuit of activities and means necessary for a joyous and pleasurable life. Daya Krishna argues that Arthur, as well as the concept of Purusarthas, is a myth. The various schools and ancient Sanskrit texts provide no consensus opinion, notes Krishna, rather, they present a debate, a diversity of views on what Arthur and Purusartha means. Inconsistencies and conflicting verses are even present within the same script, such as the Manusmriti. Some ancient Indian texts suggest Arthur are instruments that enable satisfaction of desires, some include wealth, some include power, and some such as the Bhakti schools include instruments to love God. Some of this, suggests Krishna, reflects differences in human needs. Perhaps, conjectures Krishna, Artha is just a subset of karma and karma. Vatsyayana in Karma Sutra defines Artha as the acquisition of arts, land, cattle, wealth, equipages, and friends. He explains, Artha is also protection of what is already acquired, and the increase of what is protected. Gavin Flood explains Artha as worldly success. Without violating dharma, moral responsibility, karma, love, and one's journey towards moksha, spiritual liberation, flood clarifies that artha in ancient Hindu literature, as well as purushartha, is better understood as a goal of man, not a man. 
In other words, it is one of the four purposes of human life. The survival and the thriving of humans requires artha, that is, economic activity, wealth and its creation, worldly success, profit, political success and all that is necessary for human existence. History The word Artha appears in the oldest known scriptures of India. However, the term connotes purpose, goal or aim of something, often as purpose of ritual sacrifices. Over time, Artha evolves into a broader concept in the Upanishadic era. It is first included as part of Trivaga concept three categories of human life, dharma, artha and karma, which over time expanded into the concept katervaga four categories, including moksha. Katervaga is also referred to as purusartha. The Mamamsa school of Hinduism explained artha, dharma and karma by contrasting purusartha and kratvartha. Purusartha is human purpose of a yajna, while kratvartha is sacrificial purpose of a yajna. They recognized and explained all human actions have two effects, first, every act affects itself regardless of actors involved, second, every act has human meanings, hopes and desires and affects each actor in a personal way. Jaimini explained in 3rd century BC, that this human meaning cannot be separated from the human goal. The phala fruit, result of a sacrifice is implicit in the artha meaning, purpose of the sacrifice. Mamamsa school then argued that man is for the purpose of actions demanded by Vedic injunctions aporusia, and such subordination of man to rituals allows man to reach heaven. Other schools of Hinduism, such as Yoga and Vedanta schools, disagreed with Mamamsa school. They argued that rituals and sacrifice are means, not ends. Their emphasis shifted from rituals to effort and knowledge, from heaven to moksha, from freedom after life to freedom in this life, from human being as a cog in cosmic wheel to human being as an end in himself. For example, Itareya Aranyaka recites, Thereafter came a flowering of the Shastraic literature on Artha and other aims of human beings, of Dharma in Dharma Shastras, of Artha in Artha Shastras, of Karma in Kama Shastras, Kama Sutra being one part of the compendium. Different schools of Hinduism offer different perspectives on Artha, just like Dharma, Karma, and Moksha. Most historical literature of ancient India from about 5th century BC and after, interlaces all four aims of humans. Many Upanishads as well as the two Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, discuss and use the words Dharma, Artha, Karma and Moksha as part of their respective themes. Even Subhasitas, gnomic and didactic Indian literature from 1st and 2nd millennium CE, incorporate Arthur and other three aims of human life. <laughs> Relative precedence between Arthur, Karma and Dharma Ancient Indian literature emphasizes that dharma is foremost. If dharma is ignored, artha and karma, profit and pleasure respectively, lead to social chaos. The Gautama Dharma Shastra, Apastamba Dharma Sutra, and Yajnavalkya Smriti, as examples, all suggest that dharma comes first and is more important than artha and karma. Vatsyayana, the author of Karma Sutra, recognizes relative value of three goals as follows: artha is more important and should precede karma, while dharma is more important and should precede both karma and artha. Kautilya's Arthashastra, however, argues that Artha is the foundation for the other two. Without prosperity and security in society or at individual level, both moral life and sensuality become difficult. Poverty breeds vice and hate, while prosperity breeds virtues and love, suggested Kautilya. 
Kautilya adds that all three are mutually connected, and one should not cease enjoying life, nor virtuous behavior, nor pursuit of wealth creation. Excessive pursuit of any one aspect of life with complete rejection of other two, harms all three including the one excessively pursued. Some ancient Indian literature observe that the relative precedence of Arthur, Karma and Dharma are naturally different for different people and different age groups. In a baby or child, education and karma takes precedence, in youth karma and artha take precedence, while in old age dharma takes precedence. The epics such as the Mahabharata debate the relative precedence of dharma, artha, karma and moksha, through the different characters in Book 12, The Book of Peace. Rishi Vidura says dharma must take the highest precedence. Arjuna claims without profit and prosperity Arthur, people's ability for dharma and karma fall apart. Bhima claims pleasure and sex karma come first, because without these there is no dharma, artha or moksha. Yudhishthira asserts dharma should always lead one, including in matters of artha and karma, but then admits balancing dharma, artha and karma is often confusing and difficult. In another book, the Mahabharata suggests that morality, profit and pleasure, dharma, artha and karma, all three must go together for happiness. Morality is well practiced by the good. Morality, however, is always afflicted by two things, the desire of profit entertained by those that covet it, and the desire for pleasure cherished by those that are wedded to it. Whoever without afflicting morality and profit, or morality and pleasure, or pleasure and profit, followeth all three, morality, profit and pleasure, always succeeds in obtaining great happiness. <laughs> Contemporary relevance Gavin Flood suggests the concepts embedded in Purushartha, which includes Artha, reflect a deep understanding and insights into human nature, and of conflicts which are inevitably faced by all human beings. It is an attempt to acknowledge and encourage one to understand diversity yet seek coherence between people, rather than deny one or more aspects of human life or force a particular precept and code on people. Donald Davis suggests that Artha, Karma, and Dharma are broadly applicable human aims, that extend beyond Hindu studies. They are Indian perspective on the nature of human life, a perspective shared in Jain and Buddhist literature. See also Dharma Karma Moksha Purushartha Arthashastra Karma Chaitanya Charitamrita